This week to be closer to China, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, has been China's ruling party for 70 years. From founding the PRC to carrying out reform and opening up, from vowing to eliminate poverty to leading the country in all aspects, how has the CPC brought about China's remarkable development? We have a very important lesson. 健全了，一个我们的整个社会的监督机制健全了，其中就发挥了民主党派的作用。中国共产党有着很清醒的意识，你想要长期执政的话，你就得永远保持你的先进性和纯洁性，你就得永远要代表人民群众的根本利益，要永远和人民群众联系在一起。What challenges does the CPC face? And how can the party adapt to changes in society? Now, many have pointed to the rise uh, of the concept of governance in China as influenced by the West in recent times. Uh, but you know, the fact is, influence is cut across nearly every aspect of life, not just politics. One is the government. The second is the political body, including the government. The third is the market, including the public sector and the industrial sector. The fourth is the society, including the political structure. 包括社区，那么现在要建构现代化国家治理体系，呃，完善和发展中国特色制度，那如何把四个元素整合成有机的整体？这我们今天的改革就是要把这个四个元素整合成整体。This week, understand the CPC to be closer to China. Although some believe that China would become more stable with a multi-party system, such seems wishful thinking disconnected from Chinese realities. If one looks at almost every aspect of real life, Chinese people have more personal freedom today than at any other time in their long history, almost the equivalent of their peers in the West. President Xi Jinping makes the party's enhanced leadership scintillatingly clear, stating literally, party, government, military, people, education, south, east, north, west, central, the party leads everything. Back in 2015, when speaking to a high-level delegation of U.S. politicians, Democrats and Republicans, Wang Qishan, China's current vice president and former Politburo standing member, declared that one cannot understand China without understanding the CPC. And if one does not understand the CPC, one cannot deal effectively with China. How has the CPC brought about China's remarkable development? And what challenges does the CPC face amidst increasing domestic complexity and international volatility? Addressing these questions takes us closer to China. Huang Haijun is the party secretary of Lingmen Village, Chongzhong County, in China's southernmost province, Hainan. He has been working here since 2015. I volunteered to work out here. I remember the day my application was approved. Our child was only nine months old. I go around the village and talk to the people every day. I try to learn what kind of assistance they need. I think it's the sense of the party to be people-centered. Personally speaking, I also think it's something we should do, just for one's conscience. If you see somebody leading a wretched life, and you have the ability to help, shouldn't you do it? The Erica nut is an important source of income for some local residents. Today, Wang is taking me to pick Erica nuts together with a local couple. I used to work in Haikou, the provincial capital. I was sent by the provincial rural credit cooperative to be the first secretary here. In China, the criteria classifying extreme poverty has five indicators. Food, clothing, housing, medical care, and education. The National Poverty Line currently stands at an annual income of about 3,300 RMB. 
According to data from the National Statistics Bureau, the poverty rate in Hainan province declined from 3.9% in 2017 to 1.3% in 2018. This achievement is directly related to the work of more than 50,000 party secretaries and local officials like Huang Haijun. Leading China to become the world's second largest economy, the party has at the same time lifted over 750 million people out of poverty. According to the Organization Department of the CPC Central Committee, as of the end of 2018, the party's membership exceeded 90 million. Among party members, workers and peasants remain the majority, accounting for about 35 percent. And as the country prioritizes quality development, the educational background of party members has seen a large improvement, with nearly half holding junior college degrees or above. What was it about the party's rule prior to the 18th Party Congress and the 19th Party Congress that required an increasing um, uh, power of the party in terms of its leadership? Why do we call for an all-round leadership of the CPC? First, as we enter a new era, we confront a shifted main contradiction of our society. What we now face is the contradiction between imbalanced and inadequate development versus the people's ever-growing needs for a better life. How do we address such an imbalance? Can we count on the market economy? The market economy can stimulate circulation and encourage people to create, but it cannot address imbalanced development. On the contrary, the market economy sometimes whitens the divides. Many people from backward regions seek jobs in developed regions, leaving the backward regions further behind. Thus, we cannot depend on the market economy to address the disparity. The farmers in rural and mountainous areas surely can strive to achieve a better life, and they have been doing so, but they have limited capabilities. It is even difficult for the governments. Chosen by people, local governments represent the interests of those people. For example, the People's Government of Beijing Municipality is elected by the Beijing Municipal People's Congress to serve the people of Beijing. It is not well positioned to assist farmers in Shanxi. Since the market alone cannot address this problem, and governments have their limitations, the CPC, a special force in China, which is neither a government nor a power institution, but a party to serve the people, could offer proposals as the leading core to promote help between different regions to resolve the imbalance and inadequate development. Today, more than ever, we need such a balancing power as the CPC. That is why we emphasize the all-round leadership of the CPC. According to the party itself, China's primary contradiction changed. This is circa the 18th and 19th party congresses, uh, where they acknowledged that there were imbalanced and competing developmental problems that were not being resolved effectively by either the market or government. And these had produced political factionalism or some type of, of divisionism that represented uh, different regional, local, and various competing economic interests. Uh, this was harmful to reform and the National Development Project. It endangered national salvation, and it posed grave challenges in particular for China's most vulnerable groups, and therefore required better political uh, coordination and discipline. The all-round leadership of the CPC entails a great risk. What is this risk? If the CPC, which is with great power, gets detached from the people or fails to be people-oriented, it would be disastrous. General Secretary Xi Jinping stressed the importance of all-round leadership of the CPC as well as it being people-oriented. From my perspective, these two points are to be understood as one. CPC leadership must be people-oriented, otherwise overall CPC leadership would be problematic. Likewise, people orientation needs party leadership. In the absence of party leadership, we would have populism or anarchism, and that will not work. The CPC is by far the biggest party in Chinese politics, but it is not the only party. There are eight other parties which support the CPC by helping to shape the country's direction. Probably the best known is the Revolutionary Committee of the Chinese Kuomintang, 
It was set up by a group of people who broke away from the Kuomintang in 1947 during the civil war with the CPC. The largest party beside the CPC is the China Democratic League, founded in 1941. Its members come mainly from culture, education, and science and technology. The other parties bring together key figures from the business, medical, and environmental fields to advise on critical areas, such as the economy, social development, and new high tech. There is special focus on improving the health and livelihood of the general public. Besides the CPC and the eight parties, prominent public figures and intellectuals who do not belong to any party, but who have made positive contributions to society, are also often consulted on various issues. They are known as personages without party affiliation. Can you contrast the role of the eight democratic parties to opposition parties in the West? Because most people might think of that analogy, but that's really not the way it works in China. First of all, they are not opposition parties, but participating parties. Many countries in the world share this system with one ruling party and others as participating parties. Take South Africa, for example. The African National Congress serves as the ruling party with other parties as participating parties. There are many other party systems around the world besides multi-party or two-party systems. Well, you know, when, when Western countries talk about a multi-party system, they're normally thinking about uh, multiple parties in competition with each other. And in China, uh, what we're talking about is a system of cooperation. Now, if we look closely, at the constitutions, the party constitutions of these uh, minor or democratic parties, as they're called, uh, we'll find that all of them acknowledge uh, and uh, acknowledge the leadership role of the Communist Party. Uh, nevertheless, they, they have uh, produced a number of talented and capable ministers that have joined government and continue to join government. Um, so I don't think we should dismiss it uh, altogether. Now, more significantly, especially in recent times, has been the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, uh, the CPPCC, right? And this has emerged uh, as a major institutional practice, uh, especially in the early spring, uh, under the rubric of the two sessions, where you have the CPPCC and the NPC meeting at the same time. Now, this is a reform that's ongoing, it's, and it's, it's not just at the national level. You know, we, we have a, a Shanghai CPPCC. Uh, I was invited uh, as a foreign, uh, as a representative of foreign, uh, foreigners at uh, East China Normal Uni University to go to that meeting and to give feedback and to offer suggestions, and I found it to be a very interesting experience. Um, I don't think we've yet seen the, the full range or the full development of that, uh, of that, uh, of this, of this uh, reform and this inclusion of this type of consultation. And uh, I hope that we'll see that it will, that it will become more robust over time. China's system of multi-party cooperation and consultation led by the CPC is called a political innovation in that it formalizes an interactive process of soliciting inputs and ideas from diverse segments of society exemplified by these eight small democratic parties while still ensuring harmony of spirit and consistency in policy through CPC leadership. But it is because of its massive advantage and scale and power that the CPC as the ruling party has a higher obligation to pay attention to other parties and voices. I believe a true democracy should be measured in part by how well the rulers treat the ruled, how well the majority treats the minority. While I argue that the Chinese political system is optimal for China today, I at the same time stress that the CPC has a higher standard of accountability to enhance personal welfare in the broadest sense, which includes a guarantee that the people enjoy more extensive and adequate rights and freedoms, ensuring that they are able to participate broadly in national and social governance. On September 21st, 1949, the first plenary session of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, or the CPPCC, was held in Beijing. It proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China and turned the first page in the history book of New China. 
More than 600 representatives attended. They came from the Communist Party of China, all other democratic parties, personages without party affiliation, mass organizations, different regions, the People's Liberation Army, ethnic groups, overseas Chinese, and other patriotic Democrats. The first CPPCC adopted a provisional constitution, selected Beijing as the capital, made the five-star red flag the national flag, chose the March of the Volunteers as the national anthem, and decided that China should adopt the Gregorian calendar. Seventy years on, the 13th CPPCC National Committee is currently in office, with over 2,000 members from 34 groups. The main functions of the CPPCC include political consultation, democratic supervision, and participation in the deliberation and administration of state affairs. I think the relationship between the party as a, a leadership party as opposed to a one-party system is a very important concept. Uh, from my observations, I would actually look in recent times to the uh, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC, uh, Zhengshu, as an example of uh, diverse I inputs that are meaningful. Um, it's not clear to me that the eight democratic parties uh, are, are substantively making as much contribution. Democratic parties have two channels available to play their roles. The first is to exercise legislative power while enjoying the right to vote and standing for election as delegates to People's Congress. The second channel is that they can participate in the administration and discussion of state affairs as deputies to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. More importantly, we have the political consultation system. Before each major round of decision-making, the CPC and CPC Central Committee will consult with democratic parties. Before major meetings such as the CPC National Congress every five years, or the annual plenary session of the CPC Central Committee and other significant meetings, documents would be sent to democratic parties for them to view and discuss in order to solicit their views and listen to their suggestions. Last year, some people published articles calling for the termination of private ownership, claiming that the private economy had fulfilled its missions and should be decoupled. Later, General Secretary Xi Jinping presided over a symposium at which he said the private economy is our good friend and belongs in our family. Why the huge change? Because democratic parties offer the CPC their views. Different voices got heard and their opinions got adopted. This enabled no major deviation in our policy. China has a growing GDP with a general income increase and a growing middle class. What has contributed to these phenomena? It is the CPC leadership. In the past, under the CPC leadership, we made mistakes like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So how come we've made no fatal mistakes over the past four decades? It is because we drew lessons from our past experiences. We implemented an improved decision-making mechanism for governance as well as a supervision mechanism involving the whole society through which democratic parties play their role. The official uh, description of the Chinese political system as a multi-party system under CPC leadership um, is largely discounted in the West, as you know, because it is assumed that the leadership of the CPC totally overwhelms the, uh, any influence or any uh, uh, opposition I oppositional ideas that the eight much smaller parties would have. I mean, those parties, I, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 members, CPC has almost 90 million, so the CPC is m many orders of magnitude bigger than all, all eight parties put together. So uh, how do you respond to that criticism that the, the name of the system sounds uh, very uh, laudatory, but it's, it's really just a cover-up, uh, which is a, a harsh term, but a cover-up, uh, for what, it, what in essence really is one-party rule? Uh, after the 18th CPC National Congress, General Secretary Xi Jinping released a document on how to exercise the rights of consultation and supervision of the CPPCC. She demanded that the democratic parties of the CPPCC not only supervise economic and social development, but also shoulder two more responsibilities. 
She provides the construction of the CPC and the legislation. In leading China, the CPC needs to cooperate with the Democratic parties. The Democratic parties have their own connections with people of particular social circles. Without the Democratic parties, all of Chinese people cannot be fully represented. Thus, the CPC must treat Democratic parties rightfully. In turn, the Democratic parties must fulfill their mission as participating parties to take part in the deliberation and administration of state affairs and assume due responsibilities in the government. We have a couple of ministers who are with the Democratic parties. Of these two aspects, the main concern is how the CPC should rightfully treat the Democratic parties and we need to conduct a close analysis of how to sustain such a party system. What are some of the uh, practices or institutions uh, from Western political systems that you have studied uh, in the CPC and have adapted or, for that matter, have understood and, and changed or uh, rejected? At the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, the party identified improving and developing socialism with Chinese characteristics and advancing the modernization of China's national governance system and capacity as the overall objectives of comprehensively deepening reform. Terminology-wise, governance system and capacity are globally recognized concepts. For us, it is the first time to adopt such concepts. We used to talk about management, but now have shifted to governance. The change of wording reflects a profound significance. Management is more of a top-down concept, with one entity of the party and government exercising management power, while for governance, it could be both top-down and bottom-up, and entities get diversified with participation of the party, the government, society and the people. It is a fresh change. Meanwhile, we talk about the governance system. What exactly is such a system? It is an institutional system. All institutions covering state, party and military governance are to be improved. We refer to the governance system as a full-fledged institutional system. What is the governance capacity? It is the capacity to govern the state in accordance with the institutions. This is why we believe the proposal of governance system and capacity has demonstrated a tremendous change which reflects the results of human political civilization. I believe many Western countries have also shaped their institutional systems and improved their governance capacities in a gradual manner. At the same time, we've proposed the modernization of China's national governance system and capacity. What does this mean? It is to keep pace with the times, to grow and innovate, which embodies advanced management methods we've learned from the West, good mechanisms and practices in all aspects of social governance. Thus, the overall objective of comprehensively deepening reforms is exemplified by our open, tolerant and inclusive attitudes to absorb the achievements of human civilization. Uh, China has crafted many institutional and policy responses based on Western ideas and practices. Recent examples drawn from the U.S., for example, include the normalization of macro controls, you know, and this was, this was ironically enough demonstrated by U.S. responses to the global financial crisis of 2008. I'm not saying that the U.S. invented the idea of macro controls, but I'm saying this, this idea as it's, it's, as, it's being emer as it's emerging and being practiced in China is, is in some way validated by how the U.S. handled that crisis. Now, many have pointed to the rise uh, uh, of the concept of governance in China as influenced by the West in recent times. Uh, but, you know, the fact is influence is cut across nearly every aspect of life, not just politics. Uh, you know, can we point to anything in modern China that is not drawn, uh, at least in part, from the outside? Uh, but, you know, at the same time, increasingly, many are looking to China for lessons, and not just developing countries, also uh, Western countries. Uh, for example, uh, you know, in, in the United States, many of the national K-12 through educational reforms advanced in the U.S. over the last 20 years have had at least one eye on China's education system. Um, and, you know, that's, that may seem ironic to, to some uh, Chinese viewers or even American viewers, but it's a fact. And uh, I think that we're going to continue to see uh, much more reciprocal or mutual uh, influence. As we look to the future in the new era, as times change, what, what are the kinds of political reform within the party and within the totality of the party-led system that the party should be considering? 
The past 40 years of reform mainly targeted the over-concentration of power. The planned economy resulted in an over-concentration of economic power, plus an over-concentration of political power and unnecessary bureaucracy. Deng Xiaoping pointed out clearly on the reform of the system of party and state leadership that over-concentration of power was to be eliminated. Over the past 30 to 40 years of reform, the principle of separation was basically adopted, that is, separating power between the party and the government, the government and enterprises, and the government and society. The separation brought about four factors. First, the party as the ruling party. Second, power institutions, including the People's Congresses and the government. Third, the market, including various enterprises, SOEs and private ones. And fourth, society, such as social organizations and the community. These four factors have been separated over the past 30 to 40 years of reform of the three separations. Today, to build a modern state governance system and develop socialism with Chinese characteristics, we must figure out how to integrate these four factors as an organic whole with reform. Drawing on global experiences of modernization and factoring in China's unique characteristics, we are creating a brand new state governance system. This new model is neither a triangle or parallelogram, but a prism-shaped system. That is, the umbrella of the party leadership forms a triangle with its overarching authority over the three other main sectors, the power institutions, including the government, the market, including enterprises, and society, including social organizations and communities. The party leaves the power in institutions, the market, and society. It is not for the party to govern everything like it used to, but to exercise overall leadership and coordinate all efforts. The CPC is to make policy recommendations, propose legislation, and coordinate between the government, society, and the administration of justice. This is the modern state governance system that we're building. The leadership is composed of democracy, the rule of law based on democracy, and the inherited rule of virtue. Rule of law and rule of virtue are combined. Such a blueprint is not achieved easily. If it works, a brand new state governance system would be born, different to all other systems for other countries. We hope it will work. Looking ahead, let no one doubt that the CPC is facing multifarious challenges. Economic reform and transformation are both vital and disorienting. Social development, such as quality health care, food safety, and pollution control, must meet escalating expectations. Moreover, public pressures are mounting for increasing transparency, strengthening checks and balances, and constructing institutions that are self-correcting. I'm impressed by the CPC's commitment to overarching meritocracy, a long and complex process to select, train, and promote leaders who are highly intelligent, well-educated, have wide-ranging experiences, focus on their operational numbers and performance measures, and maintain high standards of personal integrity and organizational loyalty. CPC officials are generally some of the most capable in the world. Only if the CPC maintains such high standards of leadership and prevents arbitrary and autocratic rule from reasserting itself, particularly on the local level, will the CPC continue to lead China successfully. The CPC is a work in process. It always will be, and that is its strength. Conditions change, and so must policies. The times change, especially in a dynamic, knowledge-based society, and the party, as it looks to the future, must change in accordance. Only by real-world grounding, monitored and modified continuously, can the CPC construct in the short term a moderately prosperous society and in the long term a fully modernized socialist country. For the world to understand why the CPC endures, that's what the world needs to know to be closer to China.